What's up fellow gamers, Freak here. I'm the design lead of Summon Rift Team's live pod here to talk about patch 14.3. This is a pretty large patch. I would say in general, this is going to be the end of, a f of us doing a lot of really big swings on the balance state of the game. This is not to say that there won't be some other big patches in the future, but it's not going to be nearly as rapid fire. Um, is more or less what I'm going to say here. This is going to be a pretty big patch. I don't expect 0.4 to be as meaty in terms of uh, the number of changes going to affect the entire game overall, though we might have uh, another pretty reasonable swing in 0.5 or 0.6. Uh, unless this patch does more than we're expecting, we'd like to see what a significantly lower or I guess slower time to kill is on squishy champions while keeping uh, the gains we got on fighters and tanks from the season. Uh, Overall, TLDR, squishy champions on average are dying at about the same rate they were before the seasonal update as of today and yesterday. Uh, this will bring it lower even further, we think. And then we're willing to try another step beyond that. It's probably going to be fairly involved. Something like 13.20, roughly that scope. Uh, at least the anti-snowball stuff, not the jungle stuff. We'll see. Uh, that's still in very early planning. We're still working on point four directly, but we might do that at some point in the future. Regardless, just sort of setting some context for some future patches going forward. Anyway, 14.3, pretty big patch. Let's get into it. A lot of stuff here. Okay, great. Uh, we scroll down to Aurelian Soul. Now, I'll be clear. There's a pretty good chance Aurelian Soul is probably overpowered this patch. Uh, I think it is okay to eat that for... Uh, one patch to validate concerns. If he's too far over, we can always micro patch and we will if we have to. But uh, this is basically a stab at saying, okay, let's take away some of the late game scaling stacking of Aurelian Soul and inject it as early game some level of agency. There are some lane matches he's going to be able to win and just sort of give him more matchup tables than just I always sit under my turret and try to gain stacks. Uh, if this works out well and people like the shape of Relian Soul, then awesome. I think, and the designer on this uh, is very much of the opinion that like the reason you play Relian Soul is he's the stacking late game dragon, you know, awesome carry. And we're not trying to get rid of that in any way. We're just, you know, a lot of this is shifting around where the stacks come from, but slightly shifting the power curve to some degree to say, hey, Maybe you have a couple of winning matchups where the way you get ahead, the way you snowball, is actually aggressively playing into aggressive Q plays. And uh, largely these changes are around mana cost to say, hey, you are allowed to WQ forward sometimes. Either it's because of the jungle gank or your opponent wasted a key cooldown or something. But to say that Rolling Soul has something to do other than to sit back and scale and farm and occasionally have something offensive going on. So a significant mana cost decrease on Q, a significant mana cost and cooldown decrease on W. And then, hey, if you're getting those uh, offensive cues, right, it's not doing more damage, it's giving you more stacks every second. And indeed, sometimes you are going to get more upfront damage if you go for the WQ combos themselves. There's not much point to press other than that. But hey, it does mean you're going to get, you know, once in a while, three fewer stacks on a takedown instead of the E. You're going to get three fewer stacks on a takedown on Dragon or Baron inside of the E, which again, like this combined is like five times per game. It's like 15 stacks, not that big of a deal. Uh, minus one per cannon minion. This one, of course, does matter. It's going to be directly minus stacks. Minus one stack on large monster. Once in a while, you would do this as well. You would, you know, take the execute on you know, Raptor or whatever. Um, if your jungler doesn't do it, or, you know, you just put it down. They smite, but you still get the credit, right? Like, that's how that works. As long as they die inside the circle, you get credit. So... Certainly all possibilities here, right? This will slow down stacking directly. If this is the only change, it would obviously be a director for the champion. Uh, but a slight reshape to see, hey, uh, a powerful Aurelian Soul who has some winning match through plays offensively. What does that look like? This shouldn't be too much of a flashbang, but let's look at the numbers real quick. This is the mana cost on Q per second before and after, the mana cost on pressing W before and after. Um, obviously a pretty substantial mana cost decrease of around 30% or so in the early game. This is the Aurelian Soul W cooldown. It's down by about 30% as well. And then if I understand correctly, I don't play a lot of Aurelian Soul and I don't track the numbers that well, so I could be wrong. Um, this is what I believe the DPS of W plus Q is, um, not counting the explosion stacks that scale off of... Um, 
uh, getting actual stacks of percent health damage from uh, getting passive stacks. So uh, I might be wrong in the calculations here, but uh, using ability power and base damage and whatnot, I believe this is the DPS calculation of WQ, though obviously there's room for noise. He's always going to have some stacks, of course, as well, which is going to drop this down towards 100%. Uh, but a, a, you know, again, small increase in actual damage here, but more that you're actually allowed to cast it because your cooldown shorting mana costs are lower. Okay, next up is Azir. I know this change looks very, very small. Um, our internal like this change should result in about this much win rate suggests that one health per five is one percent win rate uh if that is wrong well here is the only change to azir in the entire patch sure that there's indirect changes around uh lich bane being weaker which he's building it a lot second and the lost chapter items are getting stronger on average which azir is going to face against a decent amount so there are going to be some things around going to change the win rates you know somewhat yes sure it's not completely uh isolated by itself but documentation suggests that a one one hp5 is one percent win rate and so this should be about two percent win rate off of azir uh for those who have not been keeping track of how azir has been doing recently he's of course a pretty big pro pick has been for a while but the big thing is players have finally moved over to fleet footwork and fleet footwork has been one of his best runes for a very 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 long time and as azir is typically a scaling champion he wants to get through his laning phase and then be a late game carry having a rune that circumvents his early game weaknesses and he's got more than enough damage anyway late game he doesn't need to have conqueror or hail or whatever to deal damage he just wants to get out of the lane alive means that suddenly fleet for azir is doing incredibly incredibly too well we don't mind that he is present in pro play if his ears between like 30 and 70 percent presence i'm personally okay with that keep in mind that presence is not pick rate he is banned enough that like yeah he's in like one to two games a day in most leagues like i think that's reasonable azir is a high skill cap mage who can never sustain a high solo key winner because he's always bound by the top levels of play and this is not like oh azir is trapped because he needs good teammates to succeed it's azir is trapped because he's hard to play and most players are bad at azir when Faker flash predicted ruler at worlds, Azir's play rate like doubled and his and his win rate went down like three percent. That is emblematic of what Azir is like. He looks flash and you're like, oh, I'm gonna try him. They are bad at him. That's okay, right? There's a difference between his win rate and his actual power level. I think with fleet footwork the way it is now, his power level is oh, there are no lanes I can lose to. So uh, here's this change where it's like, okay, you have a better chance of poking him out because he has so much more regen now than other champions like him because he is a DPS mage who runs fleet. So this is why we chose health regen. This is why this magnitude is what it is. Um, I understand this is not read like a very big change. And the nice thing is we can look at win rate data and right change of like, actually, it turns out uh, either that this isn't true for ranged champions or isn't true for fleet champions, or it's just actually not as powerful as lever overall. In which case we might nerf Azir again at 14.4 because we have a relative power level drop. We want to thrust upon Azir to make sure he has some bad matchups, right? If a champion has a bad matchup, that means they are less likely to be blind pickable in pro play, which means you can just have them be a healthy solo queue champion, but not a big pro problem. So anyway, all this to say, I know it doesn't look very exciting on paper, but theoretically it should be a fairly meaningful change. Uh, Brand is the, like, second strongest champion in the game behind Maokai support. Brand jungle is incredible. Uh, he had, I guess, technically a slightly buggy interaction of the implementation of his passive change in 14.2. He ended up getting more than the tooltips amount of damage on an individual application of the passive. This has now been rescripted to uh, properly tick the for the right amount of damage and give the right amount of damage ticks um, on his passive it still lasts four seconds but the calculation under the hood is done in a sort of more i guess strict way to make sure the correct amount of damage is being dealt so this is a damage drop of 15 percent roughly on the passive uh there is also a well it's 10 percent less damage but a 20 percentage point damage drop on the monster mod on the passive and then a flat 10 damage off of seer all of which affect Brand's jungle clear. He has one of the faster jungle clears in the game. Uh, for the average unsophisticated player, it is well below 330 for a full clear. This will have a meaningful impact in that. Um, but it's like currently faster than Lilia. It's slower than Karthus. It's faster than Amumu. I think him having a like Lilia tier clear is fine. I think Brand jungle being a viable and arguably good jungler is also quite good for the game. Uh, I think opening up more classes to an often underpicked role is a very good thing. I don't think Brand is an offensive jungler when he's strong. He's just too strong right now. And so um, 
Honestly, I expect there will probably be another tweak to this number in 14.4 if we get the numbers wrong. If Brand is still like 53 in the jungle, this goes a bit lower. Unless his clear speeds are already at like 331, then we do something else. We find some other way. Epic monster cap, something like that, right? Um, but all to say that Brand being a viable jungler is good for League of Legends. I believe that. And so I don't want this champ to be 49. I think this champ is actually a pretty fair jungler overall. He doesn't invade you and solo kill you in often... I mean, he will when he clears so fast that he has double buffs and level 4 and you're level 2 and he fights you on your blue buff. Yeah, okay, there's something wrong there. But um, again, if his clear is moderate to good, I think his overall gameplay is reasonably healthy. And so that's here. Of course, the other changes are pretty minor. He's a very high win rate support. This is going to, again, be about 15% less damage on the passive. Uh, flat 10 damage on Q. I think support brand more than any other role actually lands Q on enemy champions. Uh, since he doesn't have to play for the minions, you can more consistently try to play for Q poke and or or landing it in the combo either because the jungle comes to gank or again he doesn't have to, have to stand behind minutes to do anything else so i think it's just kind of more open um i don't expect mid brand to be his strongest role by any means here but i think these changes disproportionately affect uh specifically jungle and then support next but regardless again he's too strong in both those roles so going down a win rate and those are the these sort of choices of tactics uh, Corky has a small adjustment reshape. The biggest thing is here where Malignance's damage tick will no longer count for Eclipse. So you can only trigger Eclipse off of one single rocket on two items. And that is a big deal. That is significantly win rate down. That matters, of course, a lot. So uh, not only is this power down, but also we are attempting to find some pro levers uh, that can keep Corky out of pro jail. Um, because once people kind of realized there's this, like, Malignance Eclipse sort of build, and Corky sort of, sort of showed up, he went from the second least played champion of the game to, like, he's, like, 40th percentile. He's got, like, the same pick rate as Orianna, because he got enough power from base AD changes, and to be clear, item changes as well, that he has shown up and is, like, a real League of Legends champion. Now, his win rates aren't great in solo queue, but that's fine. If people are having fun, then awesome. Good for them. I'm glad there's another champion that's back out there that people enjoy playing. Um, we know, of course, that Corky Azir is a very boring matchup. Most of Corky's pro play is actually as an Azir counter. So if Azir gets a little bit less present because of the earlier Azir nerfs, we see a little bit less Corky presence. Uh, but the reason this is not just a strict nerf, but like, like this is the only nerf in the actual patch, right? And then everything else, every line, all three lines are buffs, right? This is a bug fix that happened no matter what. I was like, yeah, we have a small nerf for Corky that we think is going to be very, very lightly pro-skewed, right? Where holding the package and having the standoff here and having the option of going for mid, having the option of fighting for dragon, whatever, like, we just think that special delivery is a pretty pro-skewed output and heavily reshaping package carries a lot of risk, uh, carries a lot of, like, design work and ultimately i don't think corky's in a really bad state he's not like demanding of changes because of pro play this is like hey i want to take a look at corky i did the changes i want to take a look at corky because you know i would like to find something power neutral we know he's losing the malignance eclipse thing like let me find something that is appealing to corky players so that they can keep putting malignance and feel good about having a bunch of rockets and have like a cool gameplay pattern there but maybe not uh but not just about the rockets right and so it's mana cost off Valkyrie uh, from level 14 onwards, a cooldown buff on Valkyrie, and then a pretty meaningful AP ratio increase. Keep in mind that uh, Valkyrie has a two and a half second duration, so this could be a 150% AP ratio. It will at least be that for minions, but once in a while you'll get it for champions as well. Like, you know, if your jungle rel comes up and lands a stun and you W forward with a lost chapter or a dark seal or whatever, like you're, you can get a 1.5 AP ratio on the Valkyrie itself. And so the reason there's a cooldown buff and a mana cost buff and this AP ratio buff is to say, yeah, we understand that a lot of what has driven Corky into relevance that players are playing is this malignance, ulti haste, lots of rockets build. Okay, well, while you're buying an AP item here, and while you kind of want to buy a Void Staff because you deal all magic damage, okay, well, you're going to be building ability power. Let's have that ability power manifest somewhere at least somewhat decent that you might care about. And I don't think it's going to be huge, to be clear, but hey, let's nudge you in a direction that can feel good. I don't think we're done with Corky work. Um, I would like to do a large-scale kit update to Corky at some point in time. I don't think he's the number one priority, but I, I think there's some relatively not ultra-hard stuff we could do that would make him more fun, but he's not first in line. Um, but this this was like my first main, so I was at a soft spot for Corky. Uh Either way, right, the goal is roughly power neutral. If we lose a bit of pro presence, that is fine. Um, and that's kind of the, the sort of the idea here. Ezreal, we just overshot back in 14.2. Um, I'm a really big fan of buffing his W to be a real skill. It had a big cooldown buff. It got a big AD ratio buff. W is now a, like, much more core part of how this champion functions. I think it's a really, really good thing. I think W is a really cool spell. Uh, I think it, like, shouldn't be underrepresented. Uh, but anyway, we obviously overshot in the previous patch. 
Plus, Essence Reaver, which is the item he's building the most now, is getting a direct buff of 5 AD. So we are fully reverting the Q buff from the last patch. We are reverting the AD ratio buff buff of R from the previous patch. And then we're splitting the difference on the R change. Um, R gained uh, 0, 25, 50 damage uh, in the last patch. And now it's just losing a flat 25. So it's a nerf 6 through 10, a equal spell at 11 through 15, and then a nerf at um, 16 or a buff at 16 plus. He spends more time uh, 6 through 10 than at 16 plus. So uh, the end result is Q is where it was. And R is very, very slightly weaker than before, but to a trivial degree. Uh, and then you, you keep the W buff from before. Um, and, you know, if he's still too good at the W buffs, then we'll find something else to nerf. Um, Ezreal's probably a little bit too good in lane right now, uh, but we'll cross the bridge if it comes to it if we do anything about court, uh, about Ezreal at this point. Uh, so next is going to be the next champion that we actually have numbers on for the spreadsheet warrior in here, but uh, Ilawi is getting the update that we wanted to give after 14.1, which was, okay, the top lane is uh, wider, people are farther away from terrain, let's increase the tentacle range to make sure that you are functional, and then, honestly, we are ballparking how much damage we need to take away. Like, there's no obvious, like, what's the win rate magnitude of tentacle range? Who the hell knows? We've, like, never tweaked this before, right? Like, this is going to be guessing. This could be huge. It could not be. It's hard to know. Uh, this is a 10% flat damage nerf, and then only about a 5%, and that gets really more like a 4% um, AD ratio nerf on uh, this, which means if you were building full tank, you're just losing um, closer to 10% damage. Of course, it's a total AD ratio, and Elawi has the, I think, highest total attack damage in the game, um, not counting things like Rengar passive. So uh, this is, of course... Uh, this this matters and is functionally a base damage. Uh, but let's talk about the math here of Alawi here. Uh, so this is uh, taking in Alawi's core uh, common build. This is how much AD we expect her to have, which is double, uh, sorry, one more. There we go. This is a double stat shard plus corrupting potion. And then uh, her core build only gets like 120 something attack damage, which is uh, Sterics plus, I think it's like Death Dance or something, or Sterics Cleaver, I think, but then it's like more tank items. I forget the exact build, but I like looked at what her four, her most common four item build was and said you scale towards that at four items here. And so this is in the real world how much damage her Q is doing before and after. And this is like all of her tentacle stuff. Sorry, this is not her Q. There's also, keep in mind, a percent damage mod based on Q rank, but this is the like total mathed out base damage of tentacles not counting Q ranks, but here is how much less damage she's doing the tentacles, which is most of her damage output, of course. She's only autoing you some. And so a pretty meaningful damage cut of, you know, around 6%, which should be 2 to 3% win rate of damage down. Uh, as compensation for tentacle range going up by 125. Let's we'll see what happens. Obviously, if we get it wrong, we will buff or nerf Alawi as needed, but that is the change. Uh, Karma, I am... It, Karma feels a little bit weird to me because... Uh, so basically, we are acting on Karma because in elite levels of play, not specifically pro play, but in elite levels of solo queue play, her ban rate giga skyrocketed. And anytime highly skilled players are rushing to ban a champion, this indicates she's probably too good, even if win rates don't throw in your face as champ is OP. Um, and so through an abundance of caution, it's a light touchdown on Karma in a way that is skewed not support, right? It is late ranks of R and AP ratio on R, which Karma support gets less of both, whereas mid Karma gets more of both. And so this is meant to be a mid lane skewed Karma change. In general, structurally for League of Legends, I think there should be some good lane bullies down in bot lane in support. And I think Karma is one of them. Now, the tough thing here is Karma is quite tanky and it makes her almost impossible for a Nautilus to do anything about. Threading that needle of what is the right amount of tankiness is tough because she should be durable enough that it is worth playing chain push when a Nautilus and a Rek'Sai can at some point gank you, right? She doesn't have light binding. She doesn't have Morgana Black Shield. She doesn't have the ways to guarantee she survives a gank. So she kind of needs to be baseline durable. The E shield helps, but still, um, in a world where lane bullies are allowed to be viable in high levels of play, which I think is a good thing, I would rather it be Karma or Lux or Heimerdinger than Varus as the support, right? Like, to me, that is just, the game is in a better state when Karma is that pick, not Varus, right? Or Ash. Ash is, like, kind of okay. Her kid is very supportive, but, like, I think that is a pretty easily defended stance. Um, So, I would like if Karma support were a very good support that was a 
some level of pro staple where you pick her to be a lane bully and your composition is under pressure to win the game because she can't just press R plus E. Press R plus E and win every team fight with just giving everyone Shirelia's on a four second cooldown and lock it, right? Uh, just by pressing those buttons. But it's like, no, you're a lane bully. You're going to fall off. You have some utility. You're on a clock. You're picking this to try to win a lane really fast. I think that is very reasonable and a strategic niche for Karma. And the fact that her pick rate increased a ton when he gave her pretty much explicitly just AP ratio buffs to say that if you're snowballing, you can keep snowballing, which is a very, very solo queue thing. Like, these are all things that I think are very positive for the champion. Um, again, regardless, some of this elite ban rate, some of the fact that she's a really big deal in pro play is the triple flex functionality on this champion. And so look, I don't mind if Karma drops from a 51% mid laner to a 50% mid win rate mid laner. That's fine. That's a reasonable win rate that some players will still have fun playing. That's totally okay. Uh, but yeah, it is an intentionally mid lane skewed nerf. It's intentionally slightly top lane skewed nerf. Okay, fine. Um, but I would really like to see this pan out over time. Uh, I Looking most recently, though this was after the patch was locked, uh, her ban rate in Elite stopped climbing. It jumped up to around 20% and then finally stopped at around 20%. Uh, that is still higher than her overall pick rate. Um, I expect this change to do a lot for perception more than actual power. It will certainly matter, don't get me wrong, but um, I'm expecting to see some ban rate drop down, and then we'll see if players are willing to acclimate to a, yes, pretty strong karma. We have some numbers here, though. We can talk about them. This is the explosion damage on an expected mid lane build of, um, you know, going to four items is like death cap and whatnot, and then an expected support build here. Uh, you don't have AP in your first slot, right? It, has, it doesn't exist on Atlas of Worlds. Uh, World Atlas... Um, and you just have less AP overall. I am counting the 40 flat AP from shielding someone from um, Staff of Flowing Water, so I'm slightly overcounting support a little bit here, but you can see the numbers in any given case. Um, of course, lower for, uh, you know, less nerf for support karma than for mid karma. Don't get me wrong, this is somewhat of a nerf for support karma, though she's going to spend more of her time pressing R plus E, so it, it's even then, you know, less of her R power is going down. Next up is Lilia. Uh, the real winners of the 14.2 patch were actually percent health damage dealers, not lethality users. Uh, yes, people lost their flat armor and flat MR runes, but like, even though you ran MR against Syndra in mid, no one else ran MR against Syndra in mid, but now she's running against health. And somewhat similar things happen with Zed as well. Uh, and turns out, yeah, it's people are just happy with their health and. You know, Zed's Renate didn't move very much, Sinner's Renate didn't move very much. It was the champions like Brandon, Lilia, and Mordekaiser who went off to the races uh, with the, uh, you know, substantially higher amount of health on champions. So, Lilia, of course, a really, really big winner. And the fact of the matter is, Lilia's uh, builds are now in a spot where she's tankier. Uh, she likes new Leandry. She's not building old Leandries or old Ludens without health on them. Uh, so she's quite a bit tankier. Uh, new Riftmaker works full power on all of her damage, so she's healing for a lot more. She is quite tanky and quite fast. For now, I would like to retain all of those things is true. Lilia is one of the tankiest AP champs in the game. Lilia is one of the fastest AP champs in the game. This makes her unique. This makes her stand out. Um, let's see what a relatively balanced Lilia looks like, who is quite fast and pretty tanky. Uh, so what goes down? Her damage goes down because, of course, she's doing plenty of damage with a bunch of percent health damage and really high AP ratios that are very, very high. These ratios are high on purpose to try to get away from her uh, pure tank builds, like in top lane. But I think that's been successful so far. So we... We're probably okay to walk this back somewhat, but obviously that is in the back of our minds here. It's an AP ratio nerf on her percent max health damage, and it's an AP ratio nerf on her Q damage. This is specifically the double hit AP ratio. I figured it was the easiest one to look at, and so I decided that that was going to that was going to be what we were going to show people in terms of what the damage was. So here is the math on Lilia passive. This is a picking a generic like light fighter shaped champion as her target for the burn damage and this is how much the burn damage is down it is down late game to the tune of up to eight to nine percent um here is how much her q damage is down it's down late game to the tune of up to 15 percent um of course this is not where all of her damage comes from some of her damage comes from leandris itself which is applied for approximately nine seconds with any spell hit uh this you know doesn't count w this doesn't count e this doesn't count the utility of her slow this doesn't count the fact that she just can be tanky and absorb crowd control and you know set up team fights with e plus r so um this is not you know all of her power but certainly it's a decent portion of it and yeah her damage is down a pretty meaningful amount right um it's going to be a pretty big win rate hit but that is intentional lilia is one of the strongest performing champions in the game right now and so she deserves a nerf i don't think she needs to be below 50 percent 
I don't believe that to be true. But of course, we'll always look and figure out what, um, you know, what resting win rates are fair for each champion as things settle in because we just are in a new ecosystem now, right? People have much stronger builds and these are going to make, you know, some champions just be more popular because their builds feel like they make sense and they're going to be performing in different ways. And, you know, we're going to have to figure it out over time, but obviously there's just a obvious balance outlier. We tap it and then we see where the game feels afterwards. Maokai is getting reshaped. Uh, Maokai is, I think, the single strongest champ in the game. Maokai support is truly, truly incredible. Uh, this was my set of changes. Uh, the average freak changes, in fact, has nine lines in it because I can't help myself. But realistically, Maokai jungle is a 50% win rate jungler. Maokai top is not ultra popular, but he's viable. And I think preserving him as viable for the occasional Maokai top player is a good thing. Um, and in general, if I can keep his roles in relatively equal levels of power, this means that at any point in time, it's like, oh, he's 52 everywhere. We can just do a very simple 1%, 2%, whatever, win an earth on Maokai, and then he's like 51 everywhere, and that like could be fine. Or he's 50 everywhere, and that's fine. Or he's 49 everywhere, and that's maybe okay, but probably not. I think Maokai top and support are very reasonable plus 50 champions. Whatever, it's not a very big deal. Anyway, um, a bunch of different tactics here, right? So first of all, we'll talk about mana changes. So Maokai support only really burns mana pressing E, and he's basically waiting for opportunities to press Q and W. Maokai into any range champion, you are not pressing Q or W on cooldown. You are occasionally pressing Q to wave clear, but not have to run out of mana. Maokai support just like doesn't have mana concerns, and this is going to introduce them with a base mana regen nerf of 1.2. And then with a sapling uh, toss cooldown nerf of uh, 2 seconds and a sapling toss mana cost nerf of 15 seconds. These are all Maokai support direct nerfs, right? And then even a level 6 through 10 cooldown nerf on R, right? Here's nerf 1, here's nerf 2, here's nerf 3, here's nerf 4, right? There are four functionally direct nerfs to Maokai support. And because sapling toss until now doesn't have a cooldown incentive, um, Maokai support, much like Maokai top, maxes W second. Functionally, no Maokai supports in the world ever get to rank 2 of E, and so this is a strict nerf, strict nerf, strict nerf. I mean, yeah, it's power neutral from 6 through 11, or sorry, 11 through 15, but no Maokai supports get level 16, right? So, strict nerf, strict nerf, strict nerf, uh, strict nerf. Does mana cost on Q and cooldown on Q matter for Maokai support? Absolutely not at all. Okay, we'll talk about the passive later, but clearly a bunch of Maokai support nerfs. What's Maokai top do? Well, Maokai top, of course who's going to get hit by the mana cost change, right? That's going to matter for him. He's going to care about E a little bit, although not nearly as much. He's going to care about this a little bit, though not nearly as much. And Maokai top gains XP. So though this is going to hurt him, uh, 6 through 10, he gets level 11 much sooner, and he gets level 16 in the average game, and so he gets the buff at the end. There's probably still a nerf a little bit to Maokai top, but not nearly as strongly. This is a little bit of a nerf to Maokai top, but not nearly as strongly. This is a nerf to Maokai top, but this more than makes up for it as a buff. This fully overcompensates all of the mana cost and mana regen nerfs on the kit, and, and, and then some. Q is the primary trading tool, plus the fact there was a one second cooldown buff at rank one of the ability wow this is a quite a bit of compensation for maokai top to make him into a much much better state what about maokai jungle well maokai jungle maxes e second so this is a nerf for a while but eventually it becomes a buff Ma uh, junglers are immune to carrying out mana so this doesn't matter and this doesn't matter um once you are level 12 you are now buffed in terms of sapling toss but of course that's pretty far into the game um you don't gain quite as much xp as uh, top laner, so R is probably nerfed to jungle. Um, e is probably on net a small nerf to jungle. Uh, this is not a change to jungle. This is a big buff to jungle. This is a clear speed buff. This is, I mean, because at level one you learn Q, getting a, you know, 12, 13% lower cooldown on Q is a very, very large clear speed buff and probably makes up for all the other changes. Or well, this comes close to it. This is probably relatively power neutral on Maokai jungle because clear speed is a very, 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 very big deal. And then we talk about the passive. Um, so I am a big fan of moving any, I'll say pro skewed, moving any pro skewed jungler into caring about selfish gold income and not caring as much about ulti power. Now in this change, there is no ulti power change. It's a, this is meant to be a support skewed nerf and a top skewed less nerf. Whatever. That's the entire point of that one. This couldn't have been, this this could have not been a line, but it was just an easy line to add because support needs to lose quite a lot of power. He's like a 56% win at support. This champ is really absurd. But let's talk about this. Right? By moving away from a flat level scaling into I mean, still function level scaling because it's percent max HP, but more of the power of the passive is in gold scaling because now it's only max health, which you can scale by buying items and performing well with runes and whatnot. 
Um, in general, supports in, or sorry, junglers in pro tend to play very, very, very low econ, and junglers in solo queue play a lot higher econ. They are more likely to take kills, they're more likely to farm, um, and so anytime you can say, oh, Maokai is a 50% win rate jungler, but a top three pro jungler, there is a gap here between top three and average. Let's close that gap. And to be clear, it's not closing much, but like, while we're here, let's close it some, right? That's the theory behind those changes. So let's talk about the math here, finally, on Maokai. So this is, if you're a top lane Maokai versus a support Maokai on the right, how much mana do you have over the course of four minutes before and after? This is like with the Doran shield, and you can see he's down eight to three percent. And if you are Maokai support with bonus mana regen through your support item, you're down nine to five to four percent. Of course, in late game, it never really exists. So it's really, you know, you're down nine to six percent in real game, and you're down, you know, seven to three percent as a top laner. So again, less severe here, but again, you talk about the Q changes, right the queue is massively lower in mana cost to the point where you know over the course of four minutes right you get 60 less mana from regen over the course of four minutes you're casting more than three queues right like maokai top clearly just has more mana than before maokai support has less mana than before and a more expensive e as, as mentioned okay uh, we talked about the queue cooldown again this this queue cooldown is just very very meaningful talk about the r cooldown again th this data table makes a lot of sense here um, so let's talk about the math on Maokai passive. If you have literally no items at all, but I believe this is counting um, every single roll, the most common rune page is double scaling health stat shards. So if you just have that and you like started corrupting potion on all three rolls, which is like clearly pretty fraudulent, here's how much your passive would heal you before and after the patch. Um, if you only ever built Frozen Heart into Death Cap, which is like not a real build, but like if this was your build, this would be the passive change. Um, now, here is a modest assumption of um, health, which is the most common support build path. Um, runs unflinching, not overgrowth. Uh, their starting item only has, what is it, 30 health, not 100, so actually overcounting it slightly. And the most common support full build is like Trailblazer, Slay, Locket, and I think it's Thornmail or something like that. Uh, but either way, it caps out at like 900 to 1,000 bonus HP. And so if that is your build for support Maokai, your passive looks like this, which... I would not say it looks like a buff, right? I would not say it looks like a buff. But let's see, let's see if we go, you know, much, much more. And we say like 2,000 bonus HP, right? Like what if we go around here and we say, let's gain 900 bonus health because top lane Maokai runs Overgrowth, top lane Maokai runs Grasp. And it's like, oh, this is much more neutral. And it breaks even based on scaling. Because here's the old math, by the way. Here are the old numbers on... Um, flat values and then percent health stuff. And there was like ratio, there was like a fraction involved here. So we can like go up and look like this. And instead um, I've done much more, you know, flat level, like linear scaling here. So it's just like, there's a break point at six where the level scaling goes from 0.2 to 0.65%. Uh, percent. And if we want to go in and update it some more, it's just very easy to go in and change like one number and say, actually, one number is early game. Okay, it starts at five uh, or whatever, right? So it's going to be much um, more developer friendly to update in the future, which I'm just always a big fan of. Um, also having random like per level spikes just feels really, really weird. Like why would this, like why would this jump um, so aggressively at like random points in time? Like plus 11, then plus 40, then plus 20, then plus 60. Like I just really dislike this. This always feels very weird to me. So it's much smoother. Um, yeah, there's still like a hike at, at six somewhat, right? Where the ratio starts getting much more aggressive, but like, oh, at, you know, again, 100 to 2000 bonus HP. And again, this is some amalgamation of other stuff. Like, okay, it's much more neutral. This is this is a relatively power neutral change to his passive, right? Okay, fine. Those are the Maokai changes. Uh, then there's like, oh, what's the uh, cost? Again, if you're maxing it last, it's higher forever. The cooldown, higher forever. If you're playing jungle, uh, it doesn't really matter, but, you know, again, the cost breaks even at 12. If you're playing at jungle for cooldown, uh, you know, cooldown breaks even at, at, at 10. Not nearly as bad, but, yeah, uh, those are the changes. Next champion, Nidalee. In the previous patch, we updated her rec items to uh, suggest more Lich Banes. Uh, didn't really affect her win rate very much, of course. Ultimately, Nidalee was a champion who used to build Night Harvester and Shadow Flame, and that gave her a bunch of bonus health. She doesn't do that anymore because those items don't have health anymore, or they're gone. Um, and so what are some ways we can say that, hey, Nidalee, you are a agile, you are a fast, sometimes melee champion. And I've been a fan of, for a while, of giving champions mid-tier MR. Almost every champion of the game has either um, like 30 plus 1.5 or something at Magic Exist, uh, or I think it's like 1. Point, sorry, 30 plus 1.3 is is baseline range champion. This is like 95% of all range champions are 30 plus 1.3, and then 95% of all melee champions are 32 plus 2.05. Um, and like those are the two MRs, and I'm fine if those are the um, if those are the uh, like constraints. 
that we say, hey, base magic resist is a constrained system where we can reliably know how much MR someone has if they don't invest in magic resist. And so we can say, oh, we never need more than 53 flat pen in a full build because that is as much MR as Ash or Syndra or you know whoever will ever have as a range squishy if they don't go Merc Treads or don't buy a Hex Rinker or don't buy a Banshees. I think there was a lot of validity there. I would like to do that for armor as well and just treated them fairly equally. And said, hey, there is a there is a global floor on level 18 armor so that we know that, like, this is how much lethality we can target. And then we have exceptions like Yumi, and we have exceptions like Mininar, and we have exceptions like Thresh, which are, like, totally logical exceptions that, like, these are just not normal champions. They don't have normal champion base stats. And Meganar is also an exception. He has very high armor and very high MR for other reasons. That's totally fine, but I, I think there's validity in, and some value in, in putting down, like, strong, like, here are the boundaries and how anti-lethality or anti-flat pen should your champion be based on class to me is useful and something that's valid to think about and put some some effort toward. So I pushed pretty hard on uh, letting us get some middling level of MR. I think we could have gone harder here, but this is fine. This is relatively close to where um, Rumble and... Uh, Lilia are as right fairly agile not quite fully melee melee champions Nidalee's in a kind of similar boat right she dives in and plays an assassin once in a while but she's also ranged like she shouldn't have Darius base stats base stats but she probably shouldn't also have ash base stats right what's in the middle here well the middle is your somewhat resistant to a flat pen fizz or Syndra build to me that is pretty reasonable I'm spending a long time on 0.15 MR growth but I want to talk about the theory behind that and the fact that I would like to see us have this sort of middle ground here where like maybe champs like master you actually get a little bit less mr because they're not meant to be darius levels of resilient to assassination attempts i think that's maybe acceptable but it means we move up champions like karma and morgana who are also meant to walk in a melee sometimes and they're you know meant to be uh, pretty good against lethality and pretty good against sork shoes um anyway just a thought here but this is a small durability bump in one case. Uh, the much bigger change is a massive, massive, massive bump to her E heal. Um, this spell really sucks on live. Um, this now makes it a much better spell. Uh, Primal Surge uh, can deal double uh, the heal. Uh, that is, if you are missing 95% of your health. So you basically never get the double heal. Um, but you also are never getting the minimum heal because if they are missing any health at all, it's amped by more than 1%, right? Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be healing anyway, so who cares? So, uh, you know, it's still, you know, whatever the the buff whatever the buff is, right, percentage-wise, it's not going to change, but a, you know, decent bump in the AP ratio and a really, really, really big bump in the heal. Um, I don't expect support Nidalee to be great. If she's decent, that's probably okay. Um, but a flat 10 attack speed means if you are not optimizing your jungle clear, you can at least attack a bit more and it's something it's okay um primal surge again massively more healings you have a follow-up pattern having a bad game um some flat mr basically to say hey you have to be melee range sometimes be a little bit durable against fizz and whatnot it seems okay so anyway here is Nidalee's magic durability i believe we are accounting for uh her basic stat shards here this is how much magic damage she can take before dying and it's like not even that much right if you're not buying any bonus health like this is still not a lot of damage before dying um so you're still you know not exactly tanky against vagar and whatnot um but here is how much healing you get if someone's at about half health missing um here is the actual like throughput on the E, and these numbers just seem much more reasonable now at you know this 40 to 50 percent increase than than the old numbers. Where if someone's at half health, you press E on them, and it's like, really on level 13, I'm like an item or two, and it was still only 300 point heal. That's a, that's a full spell. Uh, so I think this is really valid and, and really useful to you know go up by 1.5. Um, and yeah, pretty big bump there. Uh, like I said. Uh, I actually had thought Pike was going to look pretty good in the new season because he, he was going to stop buying Duskblade and Duskblade was trash on him. People get buying it. End of the day, now he's still in a great spot. So uh, he gets outlier level armor. Of course, he doesn't get to get bonus health in any way. Uh, I think arguably Pike is the kind of champ that could have um, Meganar level like health growth where he just like has 130 health growth or something because he can't get it any other way. Um, I don't know if that's actually correct here, but like, yeah, Pike is going to be a champion who gets outlier level base stats because he has an outlier passive that says he can't build health, right? Like, that's reasonable. Uh, AD ratio bump on the Q. 
A mana cost bump on the Q that means basically nothing. Uh, base and uh, lethality ratio bump on the W. And a base damage increase on ranks 2 and onwards on the E. Though it is a nerf level 1 to be fair, but not going to change all that much overall. So let's talk about what these numbers mean for Pike overall. His Q damage is up 2 to 8%. His E damage is weaker in the early game by a flat 5. Uh, until you finally get rank 2. And then it's slightly better by 5. And then it gets better by even more. Right, image better by 35. I mean, on net, this is almost certainly a damage increase, right? Like, yes, if you land E and Q, it's it's worse for a little while, but eventually you get here, right? Like, pretty quickly, right? You get to the, the plus five damage is better, so uh, not a big deal. Uh, this is how much move speed the W comes in on um, rank one up through a full build. He normally builds three lethality items on a full build here. Uh, and so 40 to 112 move speed becomes 45 to 145 move speed. Uh, yeah, it decays and whatnot, but uh, that is the, the math on W. So pretty big buffs to our boy Pike. Rengar is not a problem for most players, but is incredibly elite skewed and a massive problem for highly skilled play. He is hard to master, and he has very, very low amounts of counterplay when mastered. Um, I think there is room to make Rengar have more room for counterplay. This might include, like, you can't throw your bola while dashing. I know Rengar players will hate me for this, but also this allows him to have counterplay instead of him hiding one of his cast animations because everything else is functionally instant cast, and so he just kills you in 0.1 seconds, and I don't think that gameplay is very good. Um, that said, I play squishy champions and don't play Rengar well, so I don't know the highs of one-shotting people, but I also know it sucks to get one-shot by Rengar. Um, also say... We did it to Kha'Zix W, and he's still the like third most popular jungler in the game on average over the last like seven years. So like you can, you know, do this, and it's probably okay. Regardless, yeah, Rengar is uh, incredibly too good in the hands of uh, high, high, high level play. And ultimately, this change is he has uh, more reasons to be fought in the early game. This is mostly a top lane nerf to Rengar, where he's very good there as well in elite level play. Uh, but also a uh, just a scaling nerf because right, good players get the stacks. They get the 25% bonus AD from Bodu Necklace, and then their damage flies off the charts, and it's really incredible. And so here is... Um, so what I did here is I assumed uh, at 3, 5, 7, and 9, um, and then 11 was each of your bone tooth stacks. I made up when it comes in. Otherwise, I just interpolated a four-item Rengar build and said, okay, how much damage is going off? Well, uh, from rank 2 Q onwards, you're getting less damage. And so his base Q is only down 0 to 5% AD, right? The base damage is unchanged. His underlying total attack damage is unchanged. So, you know, he's down... 5% of some of the throughput, okay, it's down 3% damage in, in the really, really late game, okay, fine. Uh, the bigger one is the 10% drop in Empowered Q, and that is actually much more noticeable here to where it's actually more like a 5% damage drop. So, hey, two of his spells are down 3 to 5% damage in the late game, they are two of his bigger damage spells, um, are down 3 to 5% damage in the late game, so yeah, he's definitely losing some one-shot potential. Once in a while, you're going to knock it one-shot by him. You're honestly most likely to still get one-shot by him, but this is how the champion is. I think, you know, moderate improvement on, on gameplay health here. Um, he's still going to be way better in Masters than Silver, and that will probably never change. We're probably never going to even try to change that. But um, numbers. Shaco definitely is not in the best shape in the jungle right now. He's still pretty good in support overall. Uh, support being his best rule is not ideal. So um, less and less mana regen growth. Mana regen as a stat is something that supports will use more because junglers just don't use mana, period. They, has, have, they just always have infinite. And supports get percent more mana regen from their, their uh, support items. So this is a support skewed nerf. Once you finish maxing W, you get a big mana cost uh, decrease. So if you're going to do W max AP Shaco, it's just some freebie stuff here. Um, flat bonus damage to monsters goes up by 10 to 30, so a really, really meaningful jungle clear, uh, hastening to our boy Shaco. Grubs longer one-shot boxes, so he's better at killing uh, Void Grubs, that's kind of nice. Two shift poison, plus 10 flat mana cost, again, a support skewed nerf there. And then some cool QOL to him as well, uh, creates the orange poof when he teleports back to Shaco, uh, as though he's casting uh, Deceive, so if you tether it, it looks like he's casting Deceive, that's pretty cool. Um, clone duration displayed on the HUD for our boy Shaco, and then... Um, Awesome stuff around no longer losing its auto attack target when casting spells. So uh, I know he added some uh, fake spell casting to the W and the E in the previous patch, and now it will reacquire the target and keep going. So cool stuff here. I'm always a really big fan of like these things. I think they're really, really cool. I'm sure Shaco players will be really happy about this one. And overall, yeah, uh, jungle's going to have a better clear, have some better tools, and uh, support's going to lose some power from, from mana. Shavana, not a lot to say here. Uh, Shavana AD on average is pretty much fine. Uh, this change, though, ends up being a flat clear speed increase to Shivana, uh, most notably in the early game. Uh, but even beyond then, you'll still do a little something. 
Regardless, AP Shivana gets an AP ratio increase on Q and an AP ratio increase on the move speed of W. Uh, it's still one of her more popular builds. People like playing it. Okay, fine. That's reasonable. Uh, it's just not very strong. And so it's a light bump up. Is it massive? No, not really. But it's some nice love to Shivana. Uh, to Leah, I've to the math here. Sorry about that one. But a uh, 10 to 2 damage increase per rock on Q is a pretty, full damage, uh, pretty meaningful damage bump on Q to give her quite a bit more early game power. Uh, Unraveled Earth gets uh, a cooldown buff between levels, what, 2 and uh, 12. So very, very meaningful to Leah bump. Uh, the big thing here is that uh, Talia jungle primarily lost a ton here. Uh, she was a pretty well balanced, pretty well enjoyed, like 50% win rate jungler in the last season. She's now a 48% win rate jungler. And honestly, as jungle is one of the more unpopular roles, uh, we're going to tend to put a fair bit of emphasis on ensuring that, especially when there's um, variety issues, right? It's like, oh, there aren't a lot of mage junglers. Let's make sure the mage junglers are viable. Um, and it's like, is Morgana in a good state? Is Talia in a good state? Brand's obviously too good right now. Um, ensuring that, you know, that can help buoy a little bit of uh, jungle pick rate overall. Teemo, QL. And, you know, probably correct uh, stuff there. If you're already animating to get hit by Q, when you finally shoot, you will still actually be counted as blinded and, and not land your damage. Uh, Trundle, of course, has been OP for a pretty long time. Uh, we buffed him in, I think, 0.22. Uh, it was over our magnitude, but we decided to let it wait for a little while because it it's fine if Trundle was, like, 53 for a little bit in solo queue. He's, like, low elo skewed, so he's not, like, really a complete terror in, like, Diamond Plus or Elite. So it wasn't a huge deal we acted right away. Um, and then at a certain point, it's like, well, let's see how the new items land. Like, we're not going to nerf him a 14-1. And then... I think just 14 2 just got too busy. There's too much going on that we just, I know it's like not hard to nerf this champion by a little bit, but like spending the time to make the right nerfs and get it in and make sure we like QA it, whatever. It's just like, yeah, he got punted to 0. 0.3, whatever. Either way, we're finally different Trundle. Um, Trundle's power curve is very early game skewed. That's not necessarily a problem, but I don't think he screams thematically like, oh yeah, I'm Trundle, the early game champion. And so uh, we're happy to go after early game and flatten out power curves when they don't obviously makes sense um we can certainly do this too much i want to be careful here uh we have on average been flattening power curves that said if you take a zero as an example of this patch a zero is a late game champion it'd be nervous early game um so you know it's not like we're only doing this flattening out power curves but it's something where if it's really off theme or doesn't seem remotely on theme like having a power curve is fine having a really stark one is maybe very weird um so Right of consideration there, not, not a huge amount of direction or anything, but it's something I've been thinking about a little bit. Either way, um, 36 flat health is pretty meaningful. This changes, uh, this can change a fair number of one-to-one matchups, as well as a flat 10 damage off Q. Keep in mind, Chomp has a 3.5 second cooldown. That is one of the lowest cooldown spells in the game. So 10 damage off of a very short cooldown spell that is, you know, used probably twice in every trade is actually pretty meaningful here. So uh, this is quite a lot out of his early trading power. Uh, he's going to die about one auto sooner. And over the course of the trade, he's going to do about one auto less of damage in the course of like, okay, probably not one trade, but, you know, the course of like three trades or so. Uh, so, you know, pretty meaningful, right? A, a two auto difference long term, what that does. So here is Trundle's uh, health, including his expected starting item and stat shard. And then here is uh, Trundle's Q damage, I believe, accounting for what we expect a full build to be. Obviously, again, by the late game, it just doesn't matter losing 10 flat damage. But in the early game, your Q going from 116 to 106 definitely matters quite a bit. So even if all he's doing is walking up and doing like one Q then leaving, um, right, that's going to be less strong. And he's going to, you know, whittle you down, you know, less, less well. When you go for a gank, he's going to be a little bit more killable because he's going to die one auto sooner, right? These can matter. Q off for Twitch. No longer will your E fail to deal damage when it flies out, but hits, uh, you know, after their uh, passive uh, ticks out. Great change. It's not going to be that much win right, but it's going to feel better for Twitch. Good change here. Uh, Wukong trying to embrace him as a good top laner. His jungle pick rate is still much higher than his top pick rate. I think Wukong has a problem right now of being really pro skewed in his outputs. I think so much of his power level is in his ult. And pro largely plays around ults that I think he has a kit-shaped problem of the rest of his kit not being nearly as strong as his ultimate is. And so he is a 48% win rate jungler in solo queue who is still a, like, top 8 jungler in pro play. I don't... I, I'm not sure that's actually after numbers, but, like, he still gets pro play and he's, like, a 48% win rate jungler, right? Like, this champ is really clearly pro skewed. And it's a lot of it is, yeah, he can just do his entire job with no income and just be a gank champion. And that's all he does. And that's actually okay. Uh, regardless, we are trying to embrace uh, top Wukong as his primarily good role. Um, I think that's where he has had a lot of success before. Uh, again, I'm not against Wukong jungle being a viable jungler by any means. But uh, his current shape as a jungler is incorrect. 
And as we grab Wukong here as part of Reactive Balance, which is um, by definition, uh, very low scope, easy changes that are that do not require a lot of QA time um, or, you know, room for getting it wrong by like having a scripting error. Uh, we went very, very low scope here on numbers we can easily change that we're not going to get anything wrong here. Uh, but it's basically saying that, hey, let's try to make you a slightly more functional fighter in the mid game. And so this is um, right power that is not in R. It's it's bonus AD on the queues so that if you do earn gold income, you have a little bit more to say in your later game fights. Okay, fine. Not a huge thing there. Um, this is, you know, after level eight, you have more catch-up potential by pressing E and flying forward and staying in range to fight. It's more than just casting R and then pressing W and then casting R again. It's, no, I can actually use my dash and then I'll have a second dash and I can stay in range and punch you more often and I can use the attack speed buff. And um, all that is positive, so this is better target stickiness so that you can do more than just be an ult bot. Um, but the really cool stuff is a uh, really big bump in his early trading capabilities where he gets a massive increase in early Q range to where where he can maybe cue you without repercussion. This could be scary, right? We don't do these changes very often. Now, this thing is cooldown gated. Uh, you get the cooldown back by auto attacking. So he has to sit there and hit the wave to get his Q back. He wants to do this re repeatedly, which means he's attacking the wave in range of counterattack, right? He doesn't have really strong native escape tools, right? Um, you can W backwards, but it doesn't do that much for you. So um, this can be scary, but it's like, hey, Here's some actually really good top lane trading tools. Go have at it and have fun. And hopefully this is going to be a good amount of power. Um, yeah. Okay. We move on to Yorick. Yorick is getting a small, I guess we'll say kit update or just adjustment that pushes him towards being able to use fighter builds and have better synergy with the Maiden. So uh, the Q heal is getting shifted from a flat level scaler that happens to just increase when you're low on health to a bit of a level scaler, but also a big missing, missing health scaler. Now, you know me, I'm a big fan of just half percent max health that scales in some way, but that's just my proclivities. Uh, but this means that, of course, there is still a thing that you cannot scale in any way, right? It's It should be unsurprising that this says, oh, go ahead and build lethality because you have no way of scaling your Q, uh, your Q heal side from, uh, I guess, CDR. Um, but with this is, oh, actually, the more health I have, if I'm at, you know, 20% hitting this button, we'll have a much bigger health pool to heal missing health from. So this now gives him a health ratio on the kit for, I think, the first time, uh, at least for this version of, of York. So he has a health ratio here. Um, nice uh, improvement on the E cast. It was much more hittable. You're going to get, you know, much more of these, this E leap damage. And then uh, getting rid of the attack speed cap on Eulogy of the Isle. So it's no longer a two second lockout, but just simply says, hey, guess what? If she's hitting and you're hitting, you're getting damage every time. Now, yes, of course, the damage has dropped quite a bit, right? Three becomes two is not a very big change. Six becomes two and a half is a pretty big drop. And then nine becomes three is a very, very big drop. Um, this cap, of course, has been, um, you know, softened quite a bit. Now, to be clear, um, a two second cooldown versus uh, your actual attack speed at level 11 is uh, probably more than twice as good. So a level 11 to 15 York is probably doing much, much better than he was before at killing things like Dragon and Baron. Um, a level... Um, uh, 16 York, right? Cap of 300 versus 100. Probably not attacking three times a second. Uh, or I guess, sorry, three times every two seconds is, yeah, honestly, probably possible. Like 1.5 AS is pretty much just base stats and a Triforce. So, you know, not very far off here, right? So arguably this champion is slightly better at killing epics. Okay, fine. Actually, one thing to, to talk about with the two second lockout is his two second lockout um, after your next attack comes through. So often it could just be a 2.7 second lockout, right? So it's gonna be much better than this in the real world because I don't think it like, oh, you hit and the timer sits down, bam, here's your damage, right? So um, very meaningful bump here to say that, hey, Triforce is good, hey, Borg is good, hey, Stridebreaker is good, try these things. Um, this should be a very big feels. And again, it's gonna do quite a lot when you're dueling an enemy champion uh, and we're going for Dragon and Baron and stuff like that. Um, but it says that, yeah, these attack speed items like Triforce and Stridebreaker are gonna be a lot better on you. So um, I would say these are generally pretty big buffs. Um, oh, yeah, here's the Wukong Q damage, by the way, um, and the Wukong E cooldown, I must say here. Uh, so this is a um, attempt at mathing out the Yorick thing. I want to talk about one thing real quick, which is um, this is uh, halved versus non-champions. So um, what I'm saying here is the champion damage. You don't have to mentally realize that you have to have this if you're only hitting minions with your Q, okay? So if you're hitting a champion and you haven't lost very much health, um, you are just strictly healing for more because you're getting the same base value, but you're also getting some amount of your missing health. And by the way, this is using a pretty low bonus HP build. Um, the most common, um, I think it's here, the most common Yorick build um, for bonus health is just a Shoujin 
somewhere in the build. And I'm just saying, oh, we're, we're just going to interpolate a Shoujin at level 18, but, like, he often buys it, like, third, right? Because his, his most common build is Profane Hydra into Shoujin into something else, but, like, if you're going to go for Triforce, obviously there's, like, you know, 250 here, and, you know, it gets better, but um, this is a very, very low bonus health build with just interpolated Shoujin um, and nothing else. I'm still kind of the stat shards here. Uh, it's part of the calculations, but uh, FYI, right? Okay. So, anyway, all this to say that uh, if you are hitting chapter with your Q, and you're missing a little bit of health, it is a pretty meaningful increase in the amount of healing. Um, if you are missing all of your health, and you're at 1 HP, and you're hitting somebody, um, obviously here's the old level value, and then here is you missing all of your health, getting the number back. So obviously, somewhere between here and here, you're getting this bump, um, where it doubles, but it's still going to be higher than this 51, just not quite as high as 128, right? If you're missing 75% of your health or something, right? Like, if we could do that and say, like, hey, um, I don't have it right now. It doesn't really matter. Um, regardless... Actually, we could probably do something like, I think this would work. Uh, yeah, if we're missing like, you know, 75% missing, it would be like this. And it's, oh, still better, right? Um, so just FYI, right? Some some math. Um, again, still better. Uh, and then the, 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 you know, somewhere in the middle is, hey, uh, but I'm often hitting minions and that's going to be less good. Um, and somewhere in the middle is that. Obviously, in this case, this is like really, really close to double. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're already miss if you're always missing one quarter of your health and you don't buy basically any bonus health at all. Um, hitting minions is about identical for a large swath of the game. Um, if you're missing 40% of your health, it's just better against minions. If you're missing less than 20% of your health, it's probably worse against minions. But if you also just start building Triforce, it's better again. So like, again, the numbers move around, but like, this is clearly an incentive towards building health. Okay, great. Uh... Penultimate champion change here is to Zeri. Uh, Zeri's had really weird base stats for a while because of us trying to shift her base stats around to make her not good at using Sheen. Now she just can't use Sheen, and so we are slowly unwinding some of her base stat stuff. Ultimately, Zeri right now is a bit of a scaling pick. I don't think she necessarily needs to be. I don't think she needs to be a big um, scaler overall. What they put out as well is, by the way, um, Hexplate is bad on Zeri. Please stop building it. I believe we are doing a recommended items update on this champion here, but please stop putting Hexplate. It is trash. Just build crit like a normal human being. And also, you should, on average, be building IE, not Quick Blades. Seriously, IE just wins more games on Zeri than Quick Blades does. Seriously, try it. It's way more damage. Um, regardless, it's all to say that... Um, three base AD, uh, because we're not saying, oh, no, 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 we are only going to give you a late game power curve. We're willing to give her some early game, flatten her out overall. This might be over flattening the power curve. I'm not sure, but we're trying it out, seeing what happens here. Uh, the other thing here is lightning crash. Um, I'm going to repeat my theory again, which is um, long cooldown ults tend to be pro skewed outputs because pro waits between fights anyway. Uh, if you're big... Um, Damage steroid button is up more often. This is going to disproportionately affect solo queue compared to pro play. Obviously, 3 AD and winning lane matters a lot. Pro play cares a lot about lane prio, so this, of course, will... This change will put her back in pro play. This change plus rec items will do a lot for solo queue power. Um, so I, I am expecting a pretty good amount of solo queue win rate, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we'll have Zeri back in pro. That's fine. There's still a lot of Lucian, a lot of Callista, a fair bit of Draven, a lot of lethality champions. Having some variants is good overall, right? Uh, again, I don't want a 100% Zeri Yumi meta or Zeri Lulu meta, but like we're really far from that right now. Uh, Ziggs, we know these teams are going to be somewhat bot lane skewed, but that's okay for now. Um, Ziggs basically is weak in all of his roles. Ziggs used to build uh, Shadow Flame or Horizon Focus plus Seraph's Embrace. Those items had health on them, and so he's missing those. That said, Ziggs' underlying base stats at least health-wise, are pretty normal for a mage. I really don't want a power creep squishy durability. If squishies feel too squishy, despite having, like, normal champion base stats, we should be lowering damage in other ways, not just power creeping the durability of squishy champions to the point where they're more durable than melee champions, and then it's like, wait a second, why is Akali dying faster than Ziggs? Quick, give her, and we just, like, do this loop forever. And so by trying to hold the line on, like, there is only so far I'm going to push, like, champion base stats, at least for squishy champions, um, it means we have to do something else instead, and so... We do. Um, and so we will have that later on in the patch as well as some stuff maybe in um, a month or so. Uh, but 
Uh, one thing that Ziggs did lose was uh, his access to armor shards. Um, of course, he can build a Zonia's right now, but the fact that he can be very, very weak into Yasuo and Talon and um, Zed and whatnot, it's like, cool, let's give him a normal-ish amount of armor for a mage. Um, ultimately, when we nerf his armor back in like 0.21 or something, uh, the armor changes were in fact bot lane skewed. The W changes did very, very little for bot lane skew overall, but these are ways to give him functional durability back via he has an escape tool his W and he has some armor for the AD matters in mid. We know this will give him more in bot lane. But like if Ziggs is 51 in bot lane, like that's fine. Like that is not offensive in my opinion. Um, and oftentimes, uh, this requires some more investigation. Um, mages bot are picked when your comp is all AD already. And like, of course this champ should do better than a marked wood in this composition because like, what the hell else are you supposed to pick with Riven, Yasuo, and um, like, uh, you know, Viego on your team? Yeah, Ziggs should do better than another champion when that's your composition. And when that's the table comp of a Ziggs, yeah, it's better than what you could have picked. Of course. Um, and so there's a, cer a certain bit of this where it's like, mages at a balanced level of power should just look at like 51 or 52 for comp fixing. And again, there's a way to systematically prove this out with data and math. I don't have that at my fingertips right now. It is something that we will probably build eventually at Riot, and someone can uh, go and do much of this stuff probably with public data as well. Um, I want to actually shout out a YouTuber, uh, JNC, who uh, does a bunch of data dives using Lawlytics data and does some really, really cool stuff about like picking out misconceptions around win rate targeting and whatnot, and just some really cool stuff. So um, if I remember to link his channel uh, in the description, I might otherwise look for it. Uh, Makes some really, really cool stuff if you like uh, data dives. It's really, really cool. Um, either way, again, Ziggs getting a bot lane speed buff here is fine. It's okay in the short term. Uh, and then the Satchel Dog change. Okay, uh, one more change. I forgot there's more Z champions, but there was a Zyra change here. Um, so Zyra, uh, again, another champion who was a big winner. There's a lot of this in the context paragraph here, but basically, um, yeah, Zyra support really, really likes new Leandries. Not getting one shot is awesome for a support. Um, but, you know, Zyra mid actually liked the mana Leandries. Zyra jungle kind of liked the mana Leandries as well, because they actually need haste for clearing mid lane waves and clearing jungle camps. And so uh, tried to give that back here with this W change. This is meant to be a direct jungle and mid buff. This is meant to be a compensation mid-change that is meant to be relatively power neutral compared to other changes here. And then the big nerf is this. To say, okay, Zyra, you no longer have inflated support mana regen. You have normal mana regen. Um, you have normal mana regen, normal champion mana regen. Um, instead of being support skewed because her win rates have been so support skewed for so long. Like, we have infinite run... Not infinite. We have functionally infinite runway for Zyra mid and Zyra jungle win rate right now, and we are ceilinged by Zyra support. Um, I'm not expecting Zyra support to ever be less than, like, 85% of her total pick rate. But I would like her to have more than, like, 8% of her total pick rate viable in mid and jungle um, because it just means that there is another viable champion. I expect Zyra to remain a primary support. That is fine. That is okay. A bunch of Zyra support players were like Zyra. Back when Zyra very, very first released, in the first month of her release, her mid lane win rates were higher than her support win rates, and her pick rate was immediately 2 to 1. She was like a 52.5 mid laner and like a 50 support, and it was 2 to 1 support pick rate right away. I don't expect that to ever really change, but like, Zyra mid was a fair 52% win rate mid laner because... She can't shut down Zed. She can't shut down Talon. She just is fair as a champion. She gives room for a ton of counterplay against her in a world where Yone is balanced-ish at 48 and Zed is balanced-ish at 48. Someone's got to be 52. Zyra could be one of those champions. Zerath could be one of those champions where it's like, yeah, they're fair. People are accepting playing against the champions in mid lane. Um, regardless, the goal here is to take away some power from support Zyra and then give it back in places that mid and jungle will use so that people will try it some. So uh, here is, by the way, the Zeri uh, functional base AD. This is not including items up for her uh, stat shard and Doran's blade. And then the R cooldown, again, buffed until level 15, 16, which is obviously like the entire game, basically. Um, here's a Zig's physical durability. I forgot this one as well. Again, these aren't, uh, you know, very exciting here, but hey, he lives 3% longer against physical damage. Great, congratulations. Um, okay, so here is the actual stuff, which is... Um, Accounting for a Doran's Ring as well, how much mana does Zyra have the course of four minutes in mid lane? And of course, level 17 is the break even for her baseline regen. But okay, I have 20% less in the very, very early game. And then if I'm skipping last chapter, which she's most likely to do right now in mid lane, it's I'm down 14% at level six. I'm down 7% at level 11. But the entire time, I have a 20% cost reduction on Q, which means, oh, even from level one, 
if all I'm casting is Q, there's no change. Of course, sometimes I'm going to cast E, but well, my Q is, you know, lowered by more than my mana regen is, is lowered by, and then my E is the same, but like, I'm probably still casting more Qs than anything else, and W is literally free. I look at Zyra support, and it's like, oh, if I'm mostly casting QWs for long range plant poke, I actually have less mana than before, and I will have less mana up until final level five, which like is not that far in, and things like mana flow banning this and whatnot. And like, look, this is not going to be a really, really huge nerf, but keep in mind that like for every E you cast, you're not getting this back either. So if you're casting Q and E equally in support, or you're casting a bunch of E's and you're trying to like constantly fish for roots, well, you've got 20% less mana regen. Now this is before mana flow ban, sure, but like that's the change here. Now, I am not certain exactly how much Renate Magnet this is going to have. Um, it's hard for me to know. I'm expecting this to be power positive in mid. I'm expecting it to be power positive in the jungle, mostly because of this line. Um, this line does very, very little for uh, Zyra support. I expect this to do something. Um, if we are not close and Zyra support is still like a 53, we've got to act. If Zyra support sucks and she's 49, we can give her something back. But I think closing the gap is, is nice. Okay, those are the individual champion changes. Now we go on to systemic changes. Um, some of these are simple buffs. Um, Essence Reaver is just too weak right now. Uh, Gangplank uses it, uh, Ezra uses it, and um, Smolder uses it, but otherwise the item is kind of weak. And so try to open it up for a couple more champions. This is a viable Sivir option. It is an occasional Lucian option. Uh, once in a while, this item can make sense. And so try to open it up here. This has been a Zaya item before as well. Uh, so something here that, you know, I want to try to open up and make sure is somewhat viable. So ER as a reasonably more solid option. Uh, Rageblade also kind of sucks. Uh, Rageblade was probably the most demoted item for the Mythic update. Um, losing crit into on-hit conversion meant it lost that as phantom hit synergy. Uh, it also lost an intentionally strong Mythic passive because um, on-hit champs didn't have access to hybrid pen. Now they do with Terminus, but Rageblade, of course, still kind of sucks as an item, and so it's just giving up more upfront power. And I don't think it needs to be a better multiplier. It just needs to have more upfront base stats. So even someone like Kog'Maw, right, is going to deal five more damage on hit, and that five AP is going to matter a little bit for his Q, for his E, for his R, and his on-hit magic damage with W. It's going to do some, not a ton, but it's going to do something there. Holebreaker, um, the minion buff, uh, yeah, used to fall off when you were near an ally champion. It was meant to be unsituational, always on, so you can group with Holebreaker and give your um, minion buff over. Kinderwalkern, definitely overpowered. Um, this might not be enough, we'll see, but it is a 10, it, it is, the, right, the shield is 10% weaker and the cooldown is 20% longer. Um, those both matter. They look pretty small individually, but this is two different lines. Um, yes, Kinnick is still very, very good. Uh, it might still be the best MR item. We can always nerf it again. If it's still too good, that's okay. Uh, Rod of Ages is trying to make sure this looks appealing. Um, 50 health, of course, not a ton. I don't think this item is severely weak, but just want to make sure that Galio, Gragas type champions are happy with Roa as an option. Considering it's not a mythic, you can build Roa alongside of Leandries. You like might consider this on something like um, Singed, maybe. I mean, probably not, but like maybe. Um, the reason I gave it 100 mana here was so that it had the same 600 max mana the other Lost Chapter items have, so that it gives um, the same amount of ability power and the same shield size for a Seraph's Embrace. Um, I do not like that Roa Seraph's was slightly anti-synergistic because it actually gave less mana than the other mana mages, uh, mages items. And so bringing that up, this is not meant to be a lot of power, but to be like, hey, it's not worse than the others when you build Seraph second. It's meant to be equally good at least. And then yeah, again, 400 flat health, it becomes 600 health when you fully combine it. And then another 100 health when you level up because of this item. Um, this you know item is clearly the best durable AP item in the game. And just make sure that it like, looks appealing. Like this is a, a pretty decent buff, right? This should feel pretty good. Uh, there's a reshape to Stride Breaker. Um, so I said a couple times, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, gold efficiency is kind of a fake stat, but it is directionally useful. Um, gold efficiency is a fake stat because items aren't actually priced appropriately. Um, just flat out, like the, if, especially if you, let's say, use the wiki for it, which is not not flame of the wiki. I, I I hugely respect and appreciate all the hard work that people who like maintain the unofficial wiki for League of Legends. It's it's really cool. Unfortunately, stuff is getting more out of date as we kind of make more changes every patch. But it is is what it is. This is not again. This is not meant as flame. But it's like as an example. Um, Lethality is priced based on Serrated Dirk because they're applying like a one-size-fits-all systemic solution to gold efficiency, which is, again, fine. It's it's very simple and it's it's fair. Uh, but Serrated Dirk is an intentionally overpowered item. Um, it is intentionally over-efficient. Um, by comparison, when I updated um, 
Kirchai Shard and Recurve Bow in 1310, I tried to stat those items at 100% so that you could take that and be like, actually, this is roughly what we think on hit magic damage costs. This is roughly what we think um, energize, like one point of energize damage costs um, so that you could apply that and it, you could like use it as a way to to like gauge these items going forward. Um, really minor stuff there, but like it was something that like mattered to me. And so I did that. I want to make sure the items weren't bad, but then I also want to be like, okay, well, what is this item actually worth? What is the stat actually worth? Okay, let's price it in and price the item fairly. And people are like happy to build a recurve bow and they're happy to build a Kirchai shard. That was intentional. They're efficient. They're good, um, right? That's what the stats are worth. If you like the stat, then here you go, right? That was all intentional. Um, anyway, what stat efficiency or gold efficiency is useful for is comparing like to like items to be like, oh, Oh, when I look at like old, like first launch adaptive helm and compare it to like spirit message, I'm like, oh, adaptive helm is clearly a garbage item. This item isn't good. Why are pros buying it? They can't do simple math. It's just a worse spirit message unless you take like 2,000 damage from exactly one source of champion. This is clearly wrong. And that's not is not specifically gold efficiency, but it's also very easily caught if you just do gold efficiency because it's a like for like item, which gave health and MR. Anyways, all to say. That compared to other fighter items, Strybaker in uh, in 14.2 has had to have basically the highest gold efficiency of any fighter item in the game, while still not being appealing. Like its pick rate was declining over the course of 14.2, so it's it's incredibly pushed in terms of raw stats. Still has no users. There is a core problem with the item itself. So what we're going to do is actually peel back gold efficiency. It's a hundred. It's it's 10 percent more expensive. Um, 50 health for 5 AD is actually an efficiency down. This is 175 gold of AD. This is 133 gold of health. Um, but it's going to gain a bunch of new passives and actives. So gold efficiency is down flatly. Gold efficiency is down by another 10%. And then it gains the team at passive. It gains the team at active damage. And it gains a cooldown going back to 15 seconds. Um, all to say that clearly Stridebreaker, that what this means to me is Stridebreaker does not have enough power in its passive and active components to be a worthwhile item. So let's price it up to the size of all of the other Hydra items. Let's make it a Tiamat item. Let's give it the Tiamat passive, Tiamat active damage. Um, my feedback always had been internally when playtesting one of these, like we tried like four or five different versions of Stridebreaker before landing the one that we launched in 14.1. Um, but we tried a lot of them that didn't have Tiamat on them and didn't have damage on the active, which I think was like a very worthy thing to chase down. Like, can we ship a non-damage Stridebreaker where the active is slightly better? And so the active, right, it has to be a non-mythic, right? And it's like, well, it's not fighting mythic anymore. It's not fighting Divine Center, it's not fighting, you know, souped up Trinity Force with threefold strikes. So, you know, what shape for Stridebreaker can make sense, right? Okay, it still has the phage passive of getting move speed and you damage things. It's still got um, a meaningful slow on activate. In fact, it's going to give you move speed on the activate. Wow, that's a really meaningful upgrade as well. Um, but I, as like a big Nocturne player, was like, man, I just always miss this active because it was a way to get small Krugs. It meant so much for just finishing small Krugs. It saved me like two seconds every time I juggle cleared. I miss it. I miss my Iron Spike Whip active. Um, and that was a very specific thing for like exactly Nocturne, but it was like, yeah, I had always personally missed the active, but very respectable to say, hey, can we try to find a fun version without the active damage? Very reasonable to try that. At the end of the day, right, we balance the item, we tune it for live to where it has an appropriate set of users, and it's like, yeah, this item just isn't satisfying without active damage on the cast. Okay, fine. And then in basically saying, hey, we don't really want to give much of fighters who are meant to be sustained damage class um, two burst damage button presses. Okay, let's peel it back. Let's peel it back and say, hey, what you're going to get instead is a, you know, it's going to be unique against Titanic. It's going to be unique against Raven. It's going to be unique against Profane. Okay, fine, right? That's intentional. It's going to be happening here. Um, it's going to be a little bit less damage, but you're going to get a big slow. You're going to get extra move speed. It's like, yeah, it's going to be less damage than Rav Hydra, less damage than Profane Hydra, but it gives you a slow attached. And that should be good as well. So that's the long spiel here about what this item is about, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Either way, Right, there's a lot of power in team at passive, there's a lot of power in team at active, there's a lot of power in the cooldown being lower. It loses some gold efficiency and base stats because we think this is the right shape, and hopefully it's going to get some users and feel good. Uh, there's probably not going to be a ton, right? There's only so many champions that want a team at shape, but we're hoping for like three to five core uses of Stride Breaker, and that would be a relatively successful spot for Stride to be at. Uh, the run upgrade had haste on it, that's been fixed. Okay, the collector. Um, basically, lethality 80 carries been running the show. Um, some of this has also been like, well, lethality supports, like. Uh, we've been seeing, like, Senna has been kind of running over, and some of this as well, and by the way, there are going to be some, um, light support item changes in 14.4 to try to alleviate this, alleviate this a little bit as well, um, but essentially, 
right? It sucks to be a crit marksman user because the lethality marksman run over you and the supports run over you because they get two items when you get to one item. Um, and so the experience of being a crit marksman from about 13 minutes onwards is like, wow, I'm just behind, I'm just behind, I'm just behind. The jungle comes, I'm even farther behind and then maybe get three items and maybe, maybe then maybe I finally feel good. And it's like, well, there's some champs who get, you know, better Essence Reaver. That's kind of nice. A um, bunch of on-hit champs going to get a better Rage Blade stack. That's going to be nice. But also you're going to face off against Fivalist AD and Collector and you're going to get a lot less roaming and active speed on Yomu's on range champions. Um, this is obviously over on a lot of lethality users. Um, we will retune Misfortune and Neela and Samira and Jin as needed. Of course, Jin can easily just side grade back into playing crit builds. Shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, but we will tune champions as needed. But hey, as your lethality opponents go down, the winner has to go somewhere. The crit users, the unhit users go up. Their items are getting a bit stronger and whatnot, moving up in this direction. Um, there's nothing going on, which is late game burst is going down. So there's a few thoughts here. One, we think lost chapter items are a little bit weak. And so there's a buff to Archangels, Ludens, and Malignants that are honestly all fairly small, but meant to be lightly power positive here. Um, and then two is uh, there are some very substantial, or like there are some somewhat meaningful late game burst damage reductions to make the game a little bit less lethal late game. Uh, so let's talk about that overall. So, right, Archangel Staff, 100 gold cheaper, easy peasy. I guess of Helia, honestly, just kind of sucks. Uh, but we're shifting power out of the damage into the heal. Um, because of Helia just doesn't have user right now. It's like Sona is the most core user and she buys it in like a quarter of her games. Echoes of Helia sucks. Um, these players don't think it's good. So yes, taking out some damage. This is clearly better overall. Um, I actually I, I don't know actually for sure. Someone talked about putting this into the patch. Um, Echoes was bugged to not scale its heal with heal and shield power. There was also interaction where um, Echoes will not discharge charges if you cannot heal the target you cast your shield or heal on. Even if there's an opponent to discharge your damage to. I believe both of the updates came into this patch as well, so I'm sorry this is not mentioned here. Um, I guess I'll spend some time on it. Um, we updated, we, we switched over the software we use, um, for tracking changes. And it works really well internally for like, here's what we're working on and QA can you know what's going on, production knows what's going on, that's fine. Um, we have not ironed out that pathway into patch notes yet. Um, and so it relies on us in every single case being like, oh yeah, I made this change. Let me manually link you this ticket so you can include it in the patches. And just like, this just falls through the tracks. There have been a lot of these. Um, we've got to sort it out, obviously. Uh, I'm sorry we are missing patch note changes here. Um, this just has been happening, but uh, I believe Echoes of Helia is getting bug fixed to work with healing shield power, and it's going to getting functionality fixed, I guess, to say if I shield or heal a full health champion, but I can offload my damage shards, it will offload the damage shards. Um, so uh, basically, you know, one one nerf and three buffs Echoes of Helia in this patch. Hextech Alternator, I think the breakpoint here is like level 5, which is like obviously very, very early in the game. But Alternator should be a good component. Um, the designer wants this to feel a little bit like Serrated Dirk, where it's like, yeah, this is intentionally a good component. It feels really, really good to spike on this thing at like level 4 or 5 or whatever, and it's still going to be true. But the item does not need to provide a shit ton of damage when you buy your fourth one at level 17. When you're building towards, you know, whatever, like fifth, you know, proc damage item you're getting, nah, it doesn't need this here. And so um, I, you know, jumped at the chance to make this kind of flat. And so, yeah, there's going to be less late game burst damage. It's already very, very gold efficient. You're only, you're only paying 100 gold um, for the proc damage. This is still, again, it's intentionally strong, right? This is this is meant to be a piece rated Dirk. Okay, that's fine. I think that is a defensible, like, place to put an item. Uh, but that is where it is. Rocket Belt, um, there is a chance this is over nerfed, uh, but honestly, the Rocket Belt damage is not a lot of why you're buying it. You're buying it just to go in for the dash. Um, this is a way to peel off some some burst damage pretty cleanly. Um, it's still, you know, a decent amount of burst damage, right? 100 plus 10 percent AP is, is not no damage, so uh, it's some less burst damage. It is technically, of course, a direct nerf, but, you know, so is this. Uh, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, Crack and Slayer, there is math on this one. Um, so it was a total AD ratio, and now it's a flat level scaling ratio. Also, you have an AP ratio as well. Um, the entire point being like, yeah, we expect there to be Crack and Slayer, Rage Blade, Nash's Tooth builds out there, right? Where like you play full hybrid and you buy all the pure damage offensive items. Anyway, let's talk about this. Okay, so here is Jinx and Belveth um, using their most common rune page, their most common starting item. Uh, sorry, not... There was going stat shards. I am not including um, absolute focus and gathering storm for Jinx here. So asterisk uh, for the Jinx case, uh, but I'm including uh, their normal starting items, Kraken Slayer itself, 
and uh, their normal stat shard distribution, right? Things that are basically not um, not in flux. And so what this is, is Kraken Slayer and a Doran's Blade and only levels, no other items, which is fake, but we'll talk about it in a second. How much more damage is Kraken Slayer dealing in 14.3 compared to 14.2? Obviously, it is just better. Now, a normal Kraken Slayer completion is like around like level 8-ish for an AD carry. If you're very head, you can get level 6, but that's pretty unlikely. It's around level 8. Um, and so here, right, so, so it's obviously better. Here is how much more bonus AD do you need above Doran's Blade, above Stat Shred, above Kraken Slayer? How much more above what I'm already accounting for? Um, do you need, and to be clear, like, level 18 absolute focus is 18 AD. Like, this is, like, 7 attack damage from absolute focus, to be clear, at this point in time. And it's, like, what, 6 or something from Gathering Storm? Like, it's pretty ignorable. But it's like, hey, here's how much you would need to make up for it. Okay, um, when are you getting to 2 item jinx? Is it level 11? Is it level 10? Okay, if so, i.e. give 65 attack damage. Um... I think two item level 11 is probably optimistic. You're probably getting it at level 12. Um, oh, but like around here, right? Um, you would need, I mean, even if you get it at level 11, you would need 75 bonus AD above everything I'm already accounting for, and I only get 65. So if you get IE at 11, this is still better. This new Kraken Slayer is already better. Again, I'm not counting obviously focus on Gathering Storm, Asterisk there, but, you know, moving on for now. Rapid Fire only has 30 AD on it. So that's what got 95. So are you at three items at level 13? You are not. LDR has only 40 AD on it. Okay, are you at four items at level 15? If you're really snowballing, maybe. Sure, if you're really snowballing, this item might be worse for you, finally. But it's better item one, it's better item two, it's better item three. It might be worse when you get to LDR. And then when you get GA at full build, congratulations, Kraken Slayer is worse for you, right? And to be fair, if you have an Infernal Drake, that moves the numbers a little bit, right? If you are running Gathering Storm, it moves the numbers a little bit, right? So, like, you know, there are some cases where it goes down, but, like, the real thing here is Kraken Slayer is a better first item spike than before. If you are playing current live Jinx going Kraken Slayer, i.e. Rapid Fire Can, LDR, Guardian Angel, Last Slot, um, which is like her most common build permutation, um, LDR is, or, uh, you know, Kraken is just better. Obviously on item one, also on item two, probably on item three, and it's finally equal on item four, which isn't very common, right? Most games end by three items, which... Yeah. And and the rest is you're already playing through, right? So this item just is better on someone like Jinx. Uh, we picked Belveth as another example here. Um, Belveth is the second most common Kraken Slayer purchaser. Her base stats are different, but you have this once again, which is, you know, Stridebreaker right now has been one of her um, more common second items. Okay, well, um, is Belveth getting to Stridebreaker before level 9 as a second item after Kraken? No, she's not. Is she getting to Terminus before level 11 on three items? No, she's not. Is she getting to Death's Dance by level 14 to be on four items? Uh, unlikely. And then maybe she's getting a six items GA by level 18. And of course, the asterisk here is that she runs Conqueror. So there is some more free AD here. But like, Belveth, of course, is looking pretty good on this new build. Um, anyone who, you know, moves in towards more on hit stuff, moving toward Rageblade, toward Hurricane. Anytime Jinx wants to go Hurricane, by the way, now Hurricane doesn't anti-scale Kraken Slayer, right? You're not missing out on bonus stack damage that you would have liked with Kraken Slayer because Kraken Slayer doesn't care about your bonus AD. You can just build a Hurricane. Congratulations. The most thematically exciting item for Jinx is no longer asking you not to build it because Kraken Slayer asks for, a, a, you know, an AD ratio, right? That's a positive, right? That's a good thing. Phantom Dancer, same thing, right? Um, and Belveth going for on-hit things like, you know, potentially the Rage Blade or whatever. So, um, again, if you're going for a tank build, like if you're going to do some kind of like Iceborne Gauntlet Kraken Slayer Yone build, yeah, guess what? That's better because you're not relying on your AD to get the stuff done. Um, also, uh, worth noting that this is even more green if you are a harder level scaler, like a solo laner. It's even better on Yasuo Yone types because they're going to gain more levels per thing. Like, the average AD carry is going to get, you know, item 1 around 8, 9. The average solo laner gets it around 10, 11. Um, and so, like, you're already an item ahead by the time you build this on, on Yasuo Yone. Like, this is, to be clear, just strictly power positive on those champions. And it's, like, kind of not close. Um, so this is when it positive on those champions. We will recalculate as needed with them. That's fine. But, yeah, like, that is happening. Let's be clear. Um, Lich Bane is just losing one of the, I think, four buffs it got in the seasonal update. Um, we're keeping the AP ratio fairly high. Um, I could see this going down instead, but basically just making it a slightly less good for spike of burst damage. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of late game burst still with the 50% AP ratio. 
Uh, Luton's Companion, uh, the math works out to this being identical on one item, but it gets five free AP, which was 100 gold, and it's 100 gold cheaper, which was 100 gold. So this item is basically 200 gold better, which is quite good for um, slightly lower proc damage after item two, but even then, the proc damage is lower, but you finish item two sooner, and with more AP behind it. So your spells are all better, and overall, this should be power positive on Luton's. Malignance is not quite so strongly power positive. Um, this was linear level scaling, 6 through 12. But keep in mind that, you know, 10 um, is like level like 14 or something, right? You know, plus 4 than plus 2. So, uh, you know, th this is still more flat pen for a large portion of the game. It's up until item 2. So it's more flat pen at item 1, same flat pen at item 2, worse flat pen at, at item 3. In general, that is actually win rate positive. Um, being better at item 1 and worse at item 3 is win rate positive. Um, Regardless, a very, very, very light AP ratio nerf here. This is all to say that Malignant's builds are going to be less lethal late game. You're going to have two less flat pen and, you know, a 1% AP ratio nerf per second, which is just not a very, very big deal. But, like, yes, it's something, right? Like, this, you know, this is at some point damage down. This is, I mean, at all points damage down, but not at, at one item. It's literally more damage because you're having more flat pen. Uh, but it's also 100 gold cheaper. So Malignant's is, I mean, power neutral to, I mean, it's roughly neutral, right? Like, this is a direct nerf. This is a very slight buff, and this is a meaningful buff. Um, so, you know, you'll read here, but I don't think Malignus is, like, obviously nerfed by any means. Um, Profane Hydra, just less proc damage, 150% total AD, which is clearly, like, way too much. Um, I think it's important to retain the sharpness of, do you have the big active or not? Um, this item might still be a little bit too good. One of the unfortunate things is, like, it's really good with someone like, um, Aatrox, because he gets so much attack damage from pressing R, that, um, you know, getting a 130 total AD ratio is just a ton of damage. It's a really, really, really hard scaling item. Um, we might have to lower systemically all of Tiamat damage uh, and leave Profane Hydra as like, oh, it goes up to like 1.2 or 1.1 when they're low. It's the good, you know, active damage and just like lower the burst. Damage. I'm not sure overall. I'm not saying fighters need to be like lower burst, but um, this definitely is a very, very strong burst item. And hey, you know, the active is going down by um, like what? Six, two, no. Um, I want to say 16%, but that's, that's wrong. Um, whatever, who cares? It's going down by 20% total AD, which is like, you know, more than 10% of its damage going down it, when they're low. Next up is Static Shiv. Um, it is obviously losing quite a bit of energized damage, um, but this is, this is only champion energized damage. The minion energized damage is entirely unchanged and is not nerfed. Um, the stat efficiency on this item is not any worse. In fact, it's just 300 gold cheaper. Um, this is a buff to Static Shiv. Um, this is, so I've held this opinion for kind of a while that I don't think players appreciate when an item is better because it's cheaper. And me reading Reddit comments has reinforced that where people just keep saying, oh my God, they're just nerfing Shiv. We can't have nice things. And I'm like, you should only view this as a buff. Like most of the value of Electroshock is the damage to minions. And that has unchanged. It's also very, very stat efficient. It's also 10% cheaper. Those are all incredibly meaningful. And then, oh yeah, sometimes I deal like... 60 less damage to enemy champions once in a while while my autos do 500 damage who cares um right like energized triggers every like eight autos or so in a team fight and if you're up a long sword which you crit on and attack twice per second on you just like easily make that up without any concern at all um plus again it is not any weaker in terms of um getting you to item two getting you to more crit damage getting you wave clear this item is just better um, the other change is Stormraiser here. Uh, I, I, I've been speaking for this for a while, but basically I've been trying to get rid of AD ratios on marksman items and making them better one item spikes. I, I think it is valuable if we very slightly move the power curve from here to this for AD carries, right? It's like better at item one, equal to maybe slightly better at item two, and then equal to slightly worse at item three, and then just weaker at item four, five and, you know, four, five plus boots, right? To where it's like, hey, you're probably still on average, like, you know, Lucian's power curve is not Zarya's power curve, is not Varus's power curve, is not, you know, Tristana's or someone else, right? It's gonna change overall uh on in a lot of ways, but like if the if if crit marksmen specifically have a little bit less top end, but feel a lot better on item one and two, I think that is much better for the class overall and for the game overall. Um, players feel their early games much more than they feel their late games. And guess what? There's still going to be champions who are the best late game champs in the game. Like, no one out late games Aphelios. That's just kind of true, right? Um, like, who would you rather have? Six item Aphelios or six item name a champion? And it's like Aphelios, as long as your team is, like, competent. Um, so, you know, that that's not going to change anytime soon. But if we can systemically say, hey, AD care is going to be a little bit less of gold scaffolding and a little bit more upfront power, that's generally a positive. So um, here are the numbers. Oh, actually, this should be 100. 
Um, but here are the numbers on Static Shiv's PvP damage before and after. And again, yes, the PvP damage is in fact down. Now, most AD carries don't get level 18. Um, you're getting this item usually around level 8. But actually, let's be clear, you were getting level 8 or 9, you're now going to get 7 or 8 because you're getting it about a minute sooner. Uh, that's not exactly one full level. Of course, I could be wrong, but like this item is going to spike sooner and then your second item spikes a minute sooner and then your next item spikes a minute sooner. And in fact, because you got the item a minute sooner, you got more last hits and you actually got a power spike in your lane that mattered and then you actually pressed a bigger gold advantage. Like, like there, there is so much that matters about getting your one item spike sooner. Like, I cannot overstate this enough. This is a really, really big deal. This is a very meaningful loss of static ship. Um, yes, your PvP proc damage is down 50. Oh no. You are a long sword ahead towards your next build, and all of your spells do more damage because of this. Um, and your wave clear is just better, and again, you got it sooner, and just, I'm sorry, but this, like, matters a whole ton. Um, as far as Storm Razor is concerned, this doesn't scale very strongly anyway. This is using Caitlyn and a four-item build as the um, example champion here. It's not down by a ton. It's it's worth noting that, yes, these numbers are um, very close together. This was intentional. I tuned these to be relatively close. Um, but it's like, yeah, Storm Razor, you're just going to do less damage. It's still a one-item, like intentionally pvp burst thing it's going to give you more move speed which like sure is you know a thing but it's like yeah ad carries are not going to like upfront one shot you nearly as strongly okay fine to the tune of like again 25 to like 50 damage not a big deal uh but yeah um, this actually probably is also a buff to storm razor like i'm pretty sure you would rather have 0.5 seconds of move speed than like some bolt damage um like i don't know 40 damage at the start of every fight versus 0.5 seconds of a bunch of move speed this is a buff to storm razor i'm like quite confident like kraken again this item is buffed. Shiv, this item is buffed. Storm Razor, this item is buffed. Um, Essence Weaver, that item is buffed too. Y'all, Crit Marksman got buffed this patch. I hope you know. Okay, please, please be aware. Crit Marksman got stronger this patch. Okay, okay. On hit too, because Rage Blade. Okay. Um, Storm Surge, uh, this is meant to be relatively power neutral. Again, the goal being um, lower the late game power. Uh, the primary thing here is uh, letting Storm Surge be a like strongly scaling AP item. Uh, this is an item with a very strong particle, with a very with a lot of ceremony, it is clearly in a way capstone like as an item. So it has the best AP ratio of anything that's not Lich Bane, basically in the AP system. Uh, as a hope of being relatively power neutral, it is losing, of course, some proc damage, but getting five ability power back. Now, again, it is losing up to 60 proc damage. Um, five AP, right, would take, you know, you pushing through a, a total of a 30 ability power ratio to get that back. That's not easy. Uh, but keep in mind that you do more than one shot champs when playing League of Legends, right? And also, you're not always level 18. So... Uh, you know, in some cases, it's going to be 30 less damage for 5 AP instead of 60 less damage for 5 AP. Okay, well, how many times are you casting Q on minions? Okay, well, there's going to be points in time where that 5 AP means you one-shot the caster minions. There's going to be points in time where, like, Storm Surge is on cooldown, or you didn't do enough damage to one-shot them, or your AP ratio is on, like, Orianna E or something, and it's just not a damage, like, it, you know, it's just not a damage ratio, and, that would, you know, these aren't apples to apples anymore. Um, the goal is relatively power neutral here. If we miss, we can always retune above this item. That's not a problem. Uh, but uh, the the less we say, oh, your items are dealing all the damage, and more we say, no, your kit is doing the damage, the more that individual champions can stand out. And it's not just like, well, no, I just apply Lich Bane and Storm Surge to you. And whether I'm playing Diana or Evelyn or Echo or Katarina or whatever, as long as I can just like press W and Q and show up or Fizz, I just did the Lich Bane Storm Surge thing. So of course you died because that's a 70% AP ratio with a 400 base damage, so it doesn't matter what my spells are. I had two items, you just took 500 damage, congratulations, right? That doesn't that doesn't feel good. That's not that's not the gameplay we really wanna provide here. So yeah, these are going down a pretty meaningful amount, right? And and that is meant to be the case, but these items, these items are meant to be viable. And if we get it wrong, of course, we will move in that direction. Um, and it's worth noting, by the way, that again, these are um, late game burst nerfs in like all these cases. If Shiv ever was bursting, it's late game versus down. Storm is late game versus down. Storm is late game versus down. Um, Profane Hydra, late game versus down. Malignance, late game Shred is down. Luton's Companion, late game versus down. Lichbane, this is across all points of time, sure. Rocket Belt, right? Like all, you know, all these are late game burst is down. Um, Sundered Sky is uh, actually very, very popular, but because it is a full crit on auto, minus 10 AD is minus 17.5 damage of the proc, as well as 10 AD on every follow-up attack, as well as every spell you're casting. And so this says that no, um, and this is, I actually talked to the designer who did this. I did the changes on this item, but I talked to the designer who made this item, and he was like, yeah, I meant 
for Standard Sky to be equal parts damage and durability. So like, okay, cool. Well then let's line up the stats to be equal parts damage and durability, right? Instead of instead of this being BS sword plus double, like, you know, functionally, um, more than a BS sword plus double Ruby Crystal, it's not. It's, you know, BS sword plus giant spell. Like these are closer in size. Uh, in terms of what they're actually worth, in terms of you know how many stats you're getting, in terms of the the cost of these stats, if this item is meant to be equal parts damage and, and healing, let's make the stats equal parts damage and durability, and like make that shape make sense. And again, fighters don't need to be as dur as bursty. Similar for Titanic Hydra here, right? Titanic Hydra, um, the active damage is going from four percent max health bonus damage to four percent. You know, for, sorry, from six percent max health bonus damage to four percent max health bonus damage, uh, but it's going to fifty health back. As recompense, uh, Titanic Hydra, of course, is the big health stacker item. Um, this, of course, will feed into the 100 damage. It'll feed into this a little bit here, but of course, not by a ton, right? 4% of 50 health is not a huge amount, uh, but it exists, sir, right? It's 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 slightly, you know, undoing the damage nerf here, but yeah, it's right less burst, equal power level, right? Rift Herald is going to be easier to maneuver in the first couple of seconds, uh, but uh, there's also a buff here where uh, crashing into a straight-up wall but not a turret will only deal one-fifth of the damage. And then, hey, by the way, uh, the player summoning is uh, sped up by one second, so you can get in and do it a bit sooner. All positive things for Rift Herald here. Bunch of ARM balance changes. Um, there are some bug fixes. Um, I think there were a couple, as I mentioned earlier, that didn't get tracked. The one thing I just want to bring up here, um, as we're now very late into this one, is actually a Maokai specific one that I had fixed, but once again, it's not tracked here. Um, Boots of Swiftness are actually bugged on 14.2 um, to give 40% slow reduction. That is fixed in 14.3 to give the correct 25% slow reduction. This was just a personal oversight. I like by. Um, just like this has happened, 14.1, it was mistakenly given a buff here that just never got reverted uh, when other seasonal changes were being trialed for this item. Um, so ultimately, went back 25%. That is another item that is getting nerfed here. Maokai was, of course, a big Swifty user. So Maokai and Senna and all the other Swifty champions are going to be a little weaker because um, Boots of Swiftness is losing 15% of its slow resist because uh, that it unintentionally got in 14.1. be back to the same numbers that it was in 13.23. Alrighty, one and a half hours in. Big long video. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.